come and share his expertise on environmental issues with us over the past uh, three or four months. And we've got how many more of these to go? we got this and two more. This and two more to go. So I'm hoping you'll come back. Um, the date for the next one is May the 31st. May 31st. So I hope you all will come back for that. You'll be getting a reminder email um, like you did for this one. And uh, come back, bring a friend. Um, it's a good time. Frank was a professor at Warren Wilson College for how many years? About 19 years. 19 years, and he misses the classroom, so he has come back to to be a teacher again. So let's all indulge his fantasy. <laughs> all right. I still so dream. I've, I've been retired now for, I guess, going on two years. I still dream about being in a classroom. I have never had a dream about attending a committee meeting. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, well, hi. Thank you. I brought you a couple of presents. Um, first... I have this. I handed this out the first class. I, I don't know if any of you have lost them or misplaced them. On one side is the table of contents of this, my never-ending book that I've been working on, uh, which is the subject of these lectures. And then on the other side, uh, there's, a, there's a list of the topics and the dates. And I missed your first one. Well, then here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My other uh, present is some of you have asked me for a reading list. So I put one together. It was fun to do. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is there any one that I have? I've got mine. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're with Frank. All right. Uh, you had some, some of you, as I said, asked for a reading list. Uh, do with this what you would like. Um, there are no exams. Uh, on one side, here are a list of my six, I think, important environmental books. Books. And the other list is uh, stuff on American culture, American culture, American culture. Uh, and so if you want anyone who wants to come, come up and pick them up, let me make a pitch. This is the one. <laughs> uh, they, they, they polled every environmental group in the country, or all the major environmental groups in the country, and they asked, give us five or six environmental books and rank them, what do you think is most important? And you know, on down. Aldo Leopold, San Carly Almanac was on the top of everyone's list. So, uh, and, and there's several, let me, let me finish the picture. There are several versions of this app. Make sure you get the edition, and I'm on several books, but make sure you get the edition with essays from Round River because that contains some of his greater, best stuff, and it also has that wonderful essay on uh, land, I think, which is probably what he's most famous for. What is he most famous for? His land, I think. Land, My copy's all over here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your eyes open. Yeah, so, uh, so if you would like these, if you would like any of these, uh, Leopold, Daniel Chemist's community and politics of place is great. Uh, David Orr is probably the number one environmental educator, not probably, is the number one environmental educator in our country. And um, his down to the wire is very good. He also cites me in that, so I like that. Herman Daly and John Cobb for the common good. If you're going to read a book on economics, which is, is a tough thing to do, uh, for the common good is the best single economics book on what's causing our problems and what would a solution be. Uh, Bill McKibben is at Middlebury and uh, his deep economy is, is you know, a look at what would what would a sustainable communities look like. And I think if you're you know if you want a single volume on climate change, Michael Mann's The Hockey Stick and Climate Wars is the best one because it combines the science with the economics, with the politics, 
with the real battles that man is going through uh, by uh, on the being attacked by the environment, uh, climate change and virus. So those are some. Those are some. Uh, for those of you that want to sleep, would you yeah. pass them around? Okay. Well, because I'm worried you'll read that so instead of listen to me. <laughs> No, 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 no. Have <laughs> okay. you seen um, Orrin Pilkey's a Coastal Primer? Have you seen that? No. Oh, oh, but I know Pilkey. Yeah. Yeah. He, he did a book with an artist where he did the science and she did the ah. art by uh -huh. flying uh -huh. over. And, uh, but it's a very interesting book. If I, if I can have your email address, I'll send mm -hmm. over all the information. Sure. It's worth sure. looking at. Yeah, did I need my email address on the email? You wrote it on the board one. one well, let me write it on the board uh, again. Orrin Pilkey, yeah. P I L K E Y, and Mary Edna Frazier. And there's only one book of that nature. And it's called A Primer on Coastal Ecology or something like that. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, my students always like it when you get in a class by saying, let us review. <laughs> that, that always gets the pencil on me. <laughs> let us review where we've gone so far. In this. Uh, the first lecture, I talked about environmental politics and all the different ways, uh, all the different ways various people view environmental issues, define the issues, define the solutions, etc. In the second lecture, I looked at the American Constitution from an environmental perspective and I asked the question, what are the chances that we can get good environmental legislation passed given the system? And the answer is not too good. Okay. Uh, what I want to do today is look at the American Constitution in a different second sense. There's two meanings of the word Constitution. One, Constitution in the sense most Americans understand it, that formal document that was written in 1787 is the fundamental all the way. But there's a second notion of Constitution, and that's the Constitution in the British sense. The British don't have a written Constitution. But if you ask any Brit, do you have a Constitution, they would say, of course. But what it is, it's their customs, it's their habits, it's their values, it's all those things that combine to make Britain, Britain. All right? It's their political culture, it's their values. And I want to look at American, uh, today I want to look at American culture, American Constitution in that second cultural sense. What do Americans believe in? Okay. What values do we hold? What principles do we what principles do we abide by? Next month, I'll, I'll ask how do those principles get embodied in our founding in the American founding with specific people, namely, namely, Madison, Hamilton, and Jefferson. That's my two dreams and a nightmare. Um, <laughs> To, to make sure everybody comes back. The two dreams are Jefferson and Hamilton and the nightmares Madison. <laughs> uh, now, i got a tough job today because today I want to just look at these principles from a, from a point of view of the assumptions and the logic of them. And I don't want, and I want to save the application for next month. Okay? That's tough to do because I keep wanting to give examples and the examples are going to be from American politics. So if I say, I'll probably say several times, let's hold off that discussion, the actual application to next month. Let's begin, though, by beginning by talking about American values, American beliefs, American habits. And the question that I want to ask you, or the question I ask myself is where to start this discussion, where to begin it. And for reasons that I hope I can explain to you, I'd like to begin in 1955. America in 1955 was a nation that would, in many ways was being torn apart ideologically. On the left, you had, you had <clears throat> progressives, you had the followers of Charles Beard, you had People who were arguing that the American Constitution was a class-based document made to guarantee the rule of the rich. 
that, that the American Constitution was in fact the product of class warfare. To many Americans, this not only smelled of Marxism, it reeked of it. Uh, on the right, you had Joseph McCarthy right, arguing that communism was creep communism and creeping socialism was spreading across the country, witness the folks on the other side, right, and that what and that the ideas that these people were putting forth were quote un-American. They don't they didn't think like the rest of us. So you had the left Beardian class warfare people, and you had the right stalking the un-Americans. In that in that setting, a group of academics, historians, and writers emerged in the middle. And they, they argued against both the left and the right. right. Against the left, they said, look, Beard was just flat out empirically wrong. There was no class conflict in 1787. There certainly wasn't any conflict between the uh, the, the agrarians and the rising capitalists, Beard was just wrong. America in 1787 was typified as it is now by a broad middle class. And then, then they attacked the right by saying, and this was an interesting point, by saying, look, there's no such thing as un-American thought. All Americans think alike. And in fact, the American Constitution is the embodiment of that broad consensus of values that Americans have. This became known as the consensus interpretation of the American Constitution. The, American, the founding fathers were pragmatic, non-ideological, non-philosophical people who just wanted to solve problems. And the American Constitution, the American Constitution is the brilliant articulation of that middle compromise position, that consensus on values. And, and in fact, and you had people like, of course, I, well, the attack, the attack was by Robert Brown in books like Charles Beard. But people like Daniel Borston, the genius of American politics, and, and <coughs> Edmund Morgan, and was another one, they argued that America, the, the, what makes the American Constitution so durable, so stable, is that it is so much in line with American values and culture. See this? Probably, the mo probably, from my perspective, the most influential, or at least insightful, book came out in 1955 by Professor Louis Hartz, and he talked about the liberal tradition in America. And what Hartz says, yes, there is a broad consensus, and that consensus is built around this thing that we call liberalism. Now, this is tough, because when we th say the word liberalism, we think of, you know, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, or we think of liberals. But what Hartz argued is beyond liberals, there is this philosophy that we call liberalism. And the truth is, Everybody in America believes in it. People that we call conservatives in America are in fact simply classical liberals. People that we call liberals in America are simply progressive liberals. But they're all liberals. And so don't worry about an American act. You see, you see what these guys are doing? They're saying, cool it. Cool it on the left. Don't quit quit this class conflict stuff and cool it on the right, let's let's stop the let's stop the blacklisting and the witch hunts. Okay? What was Hart's argument here? What are the fundamental principles? Everybody follow me? Could you give that name? How do you spell it? Oh, H A R T Z. Okay? Yeah. Um, what are the fundamental principles of individual of liberalism? And there is one, one overriding principle. I, t I tell this to my introduction to American government students. It's like everybody in this room believes it, but you've never actually sat there and spoken it. The number one principle is individualism. America 
is the most liberal, America is the most liberal country on earth because we are the most individualistic country on earth. We came here, we didn't, with the exception of African Americans, we came here mostly as individuals. Uh, you ask an American, who are you? And what are they going to say? I'm me. I'm just Frank. You know, I mean, picture walking up to an American saying, who are you? And have them respond, I'm a member of the international proletariat. <laughs> we would all draw back, probably. You know, picture, you know, who will go up to an American and say, who are you? And they say, I'm a white man. You know, that, that's, that would be someone who saw their race or their class as being more important than themselves as an individual. Americans don't do that. Individualism, and the one thing, this is ironic, the one thing all Americans believe in is the deep belief that they don't share any values. That's the one value they all share. I mean, what, you know, try teaching 20-year-olds. I'm just me. I have my own perspective. Nobody understands me but me. God, it must be lonely in there. Uh, <laughs> you know, you just give me the facts and I'll decide for myself. Yes? Uh, I, was watching, I was watching the TV last a couple nights ago. I shouldn't do that. And there's this ad for TD Ameritrade or some stockbroker. And the guy comes in there and says, I don't invest like other people invest. I invest like I invest. For, I invest like, uh, for, for, not for me, but uh, he obviously does that. But for, I invest the way I invest. And I, and I wanted to say, gee, how successful is that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> individualism, individualism, individualism. That's the key to understanding America. Sir? How would it be different in Europe or somewhere else? It, Hartz, thank you. Hartz, in a different book, not in this one, but points out, what points out, he says, socialism doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell in America. He doesn't use that coarse phrase. Because to have socialism, you must have a deep, deep abiding class consciousness. See that? Mm -hmm. And Europe has socialism because Europe has class consciousness and Europe has class consciousness because it had 400 years of feudalism where, where the, the, the elites were elites because they knew they were born that way. The serfs were serfs that because they were born that way and there was a fundamental faith in human inequality, you know, and they, and they and they came and they came to instill in both the elites, the rich and the poor, a fundamental faith that their condition in life was not of their doing. If you ask a wealthy Englishman, why are you rich? Okay? Chances are they'll respond. I'm a Barrison Tipton, and the Barrison Tiptons have always been rich. <laughs> or, or if they had a little bit more tact, the Barrison Tiptons have always been fortunate. If you ask a rich American, why are you rich, what are they going to say? I earned it. I worked hard. Even, 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 yeah, I, I did it on my own. Even, even though, even though, even though that could be the, you know, the biggest bunch of crap. <laughs> I'm, you know, I was when I was in the National Guard, I had a DuPont in my National Guard uniform dodging the draft like I was. I mean, he got, he got like $40 million on his 20th birthday. And if you ask him, you know, why are you rich? He'd say, I like work hard. That's amazing. Yeah. But it works because they know that's what's acceptable to the American mind. And I'm probably if you strap them on a lie detector desk and ask Donald Trump, you know, why are you rich? He'd say, I worked, I earned it. So it's there's something of an illusion in this. Oh, it's belief, complete. Belief becomes reality. Oh, absolutely. Which may or may not be true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, th this isn't reality. Reality's next class. <laughs>
But have I driven home this faith in American individualism, sir? But at the same time, aren't Americans have a pension to join? I mean, they're members of churches, they're members oh, of absolutely. Uh, political absolutely. parties, they're the members of, I mean, and that's how they largely identify themselves often. So, so that's yeah. not very individual. Yeah. Well, and, and, and Alexis de Tocqueville, who's on my reading list, absolutely brilliant. Look, this produces a lot of, well, Americans believe in freedom, they believe in liberty. We are probably meant because because that grows out of the individualism. You see that I ought to be allowed to do what I want to do as long as I don't interfere with somebody. But you're right. It also produces a lot of loneliness, a lot of I don't mean. I mean, what's the complaint of every teenager in America? I don't know what I want to do with my life. Yes? No and every no and every understands me. And, and no one <laughs> understands me. <laughs> to which every parent in a futile attempt at a, says, well, you can be whatever you want to be. <laughs> to which the res kid responds, but I don't know what I want to be. And back and forth it goes, and back and forth it goes. It's it's what the Tocqueville is going to what the Tocqueville argues. Brilliantly, is because we are so free, because we are so individualistic, we are also one of the most, one of the society that is a deeply, deeply embedded conformists. He was the first one to talk about the tyranny of majority opinion, where, where people will form in, in associations or cliques or fads, um, and it will. Um, it's a double-edged sword. See this, and it both st and, and both the conformity and the joining. Um, note this: you're joining. You're not being assigned. The 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 peasants of Europe did not join the peasantry. <laughs> All right. Uh, it all stems from this. Fair. This leads, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to experiment with something. I'm, I'm shifting this way. This leads to another deeply held belief of America. Americans believe in progress. They believe, oh, we're not fools. We understand that there's, you know, occasional slippages back. But basically, over time, Americans believe things are getting better. Innovation, change, experimentation might produce a little, but basically those things are good because they lead to progress. Okay? And then the question becomes, progress from what? Mm -hmm. Humans, Americans basically see, if you ask Americans about time, they see time kind of like, you know, uh, l l let me give a few downturns there wasn't the depression. But basically, things are getting better. Okay? The question becomes, well, what was it back here? And the answer is, either psychologically, and that's important, or anthropologically, the liberal, the liberal er, early liberal writers, and I'm talking 1650 to, to today, they concocted this notion that they called the state of nature. Now, a state of nature was not to be taken as an anthropological, they're not talking about Indians, all right? to some extent. What they're asking, what they're trying to figure out is, what is human nature? And so they ask this question. Suppose government, society, poof, went away. That all we had was what was deeply embedded in us. 
What do you think it'd be like? Chaos. What does anarchy mean to you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> A man named Thomas Hobbes, who was not a liberal, said it would be chaos. It would be not that not that I think all my fellow humans are no good. <laughs> Right? I'm willing to admit 90% of them are wonderful people. But there's that rotten apple out there. I don't know about you, but when I park my car across the street, I lock the door. Not because I think that the next person is going to you know, take, every, take my wonderful belongings out of it, but because that next person might be that one rotten apple. Now, what... Hobbes then goes on and says, humans are, humans are individual, they're free, they believe in progress, and they're rational. They can reason. Probably the only creatures that can do that. As a rational person, in a state of nature, the only rational thing to do is for me to assume that the next person walking up that path is going to get me. So I got to attack them first. But they know it, but they're thinking the same way. So they've got to attack me first. And as a result, Hobbes' classic line is it's the war of all against all. And his beautiful line, well, not beautiful, his line that from his book Leviathan, he says, in a state of nature, he says, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. <clears throat> there's no economy. There's no commodious living. Remember this. Remember this. Because Hobbes was not a liberal. Hobbes said to get, Hobbes says, Given that total chaos, the only rational thing to do is to surrender every, all my power, all my authority, all my rights to government. We're asking only one thing in return, keep me safe. How much, how much America is becoming a Hobbesian world, I will leave it to your own analysis. <laughs> To figure out. Hobbes was not a <laughs> Because another, the real liberals came around and said, yes, this is a state of nature. But though it is a state of nature, they said, it is not a state of war. Humans have reason. And they can understand, and they can use that reason to understand that to survive and thrive they need to reckon, to respect certain behaviors on the part of each other. They need to respect that they have certain things that they are entitled to. And respect that other people are entitled to those things too. And so this branch of liberalism develops this notion of rights. And oh my God, do Americans believe in rights. You cannot engage in a political discussion with. I remember once. I remember once. I had a class. The class was limited to like twenty, and twenty-five people showed up first day, and five of them wanted to add the course. They weren't on the list. So I figured, learning experience. Okay, you twenty that are in the course. What should we do with these five people? <laughs> well, I didn't sign up to attend a private college to have overcrowded classrooms. So, well, 25 is overcrowded. Boy, you should have seen me in Delaware with 300. I have a right to a small classroom. Yeah, the five said. I have a right to an education. That quick became a debate over rights. So what you do with the students? What? <laughs> we want to in here. I have a right. I have, my exhibition doesn't have a has a right to have the biggest class I can sign up. All right. If you ask somebody, do you have?
do you have a right to keep and bear arms or to marry someone of the same gender or whatever, or you know, or to have an abortion or to whatever? How will they respond? They will respond with an argument. Yes? And they throw in a few evidence, but then the other side will too. Liberalism, at least this strand, believes that humans have reason and they have rights. We create government to protect and extend our rights. When we talk about progress, right? when we talk about progress, we mean a society that has... Where do these rights come from, by the way? They're well, inalienable. They, well, they're inalienable, but where do they come from? They come from, they come from, don't, don't jump in the next week yet, Frank. They come from one or two sources. They come from just who we are. They come from our very, the nature of human beings. They are natural rights. All right? Or, the, or if, you're, if you're so inclined, they, get, they are given to us by God. These are God, and you can combine them by saying they're God-given natural rights. Now Hobbes, I mean, contrast here, Hobbes believed that the state of nature was so bad, right, that we had to create authority, government, and law to protect us, or not, all right, and therefore, and therefore government and law defined what was just, what was, what, what they needed to do, and Hobbes made the following classical statement, he says, there is no such thing as an unjust law. <coughs> All right? If the sovereign believes that that law is necessary, then it's just. Yeah, and I always do this to my class. I repeat it. There is no such thing as an unjust law. Is there a single person in this room that believes that? No. <laughs> that's the consensus see that that's the consensus why don't we believe that there's why do we believe that there's such a thing as an unjust law an unjust because we believe that we have rights and governments are made to protect those rights and if government violates those rights then it has done something unjust see it that so, th so it's that it's the notion it's the derivation of natural law from reason, okay, and and these rights. Now, that leads to another belief the liberals have, and that is a fundamental faith in human equality. Now, let's be clear what they mean when they see, say equality. They by no means mean economic equality. All right. They probably don't mean intellectual equality. Certainly not physical equality. But when they say, when, when they, they say humans are equal, they are talking about they are equal in their rights. You understand that? I mean, notions of equality are tied to the notions of rights, which are tied to the notions of reason. Human, and what are some of these rights? For the early British philosophers, there were three big ones. Life, liberty, and property. Or they called it the state. Because humans, in a state of nature, not only were individuals and they're free and they had progress, they also needed things. They were, they wanted to acquire things. They were acquisitive. And so I'd be walking along in the state of nature, and I'd see a deer. Who did the deer belong to in the state of nature? No one. Okay? No one. But I'm a pretty good shot with a bow. I kill it. I've mixed my labor, which is part of me, see this, with that deer. So the deer is now... Part of me, the deer is now taken out of the commons, and it's and it's partially wild animal, but it's also partially my cutting, killing, and butchering process. 
that deer becomes my private property. Labor, right? When we mix labor with nature, get ready, here comes the ecology. When we mix labor with nature, we create property and we create value. How much is nature worth that has not been had human labor mixed with it? And the answer for Locke is it's worthless. It's worthless. The answer to who? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I snuck his name in. The answer, to, the answer to this liberalism, the labor theory of value holds, all right, the labor theory of value holds that it is human labor that provides 99 one hundredth percent of the value of anything. Land that is left wholly to nature, i.e. wilderness, is called, as indeed it is, wasteland. You see that? Do you understand that? You begin to understand, do you understand what a nation of labor of liberals is going to do to nature? <laughs> okay. Uh, but you know, here I am, I've got my deer. So you're walking along and you're picking apples. Okay? And I can trade my apples for a cut of your deer. As long as Two rational people, if I say to you, if I say to you, I'll give you a hind quarter of deer for a bushel of apples, and if you say okay, and I say okay, you're a rational person, I'm a rational person, we can have an exchange. Is anyone's rights hurt? No. I say to you, if I say to you, Susie, if I say to you, Susie, I'll give you uh, a tip off this antler. For, for four bushels of apples, all right, and you say a tip off the apple for a tip off the antler for four apples. I said, yeah, that's that's the deal I'm proposing. As long as you understand, as long as I don't commit fraud or lie to you, and you say, okay, have I hurt you? Have I violated your rights? There is no such thing as an unfair trade among consenting adults. What about marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. It's all, it's it's virtually impossible, all right, for a liberal this type to oppose law, you know, oppose marijuana law. I mean, excuse me, to support marijuana law. Right? If I want it and you've got it for sale, and we're not hurting anybody else, okay? Here's the site. How do we decide these things? We decide these things by free economic markets. See this? Now, how much deer can I accumulate? Can I accumulate? Can I go out and you know shoot every deer I see? They say capital said no. There's two restrictions. You shouldn't be wasteful. You should only take as much as you can use. And you should leave something behind for other people. Okay? But then comes the glitch. Susie wants to trade me apples for deer. I'm temporarily out of deer. But I said, Susie, I've got this rock. I'll trade you the rock for a bushel of apples. Okay? She stops to think about it. I said, but Susie, look, this... This rock has got beautiful yellow metal in it. And you say, oh, that's nice. Okay, I'll trade. The invention of money. Gold. See it? Okay. Trading, trading the products of your labor for gold, money, violates no one's right. But now here comes the glitch. How much, how much property am I allowed to accumulate until it spoils? But gold never spoils. So how much gold am I allowed to accumulate? All I can possibly get. See this? 
and I've done, and if you interfere with that, if you interfere with my community, you've got to understand this, to understand the current debates over taxes. If you interfere with my accumulation of wealth, you're violating my rights. But how about leaving them enough and it's good for, for other people? Well, if all I do is take the gold and store it and hoard it, then yes, I'm not having left this much. But if I take the, my wealth and invest it, pay people, look, you're not a very good apple picker, but I'll make a deal. I'll hire you to build a shed for you. And I'll give you some gold and you can go buy apples with it. Okay. Investing money produces more opportunity than you ever had in the state of nature. So, capitalism capitalism is basically the economic system that is most compatible <coughs> with human nature and with human rights. There is no such thing as democratic socialism, according to this argument. If you want to make, if you want to take from the rich and give to the poor, the only way you can do this is to violate someone's rights. I don't know if Ronald Reagan ever studied this, but he believed it with every ounce of fiber of his body. Hell, most of us do. Okay. Um, government then, government, since we are free, rational people, this all boils down to one thing, keeping promises, both the economic system and the political system rest on consent. You consent, free markets rest on consent, and government should rest on consent. This is... This is revolutionary ideology in 1688. I mean, there are people being there are people being hung in England for proposing this, right? And I'll remember. He says, "But what you got to understand, it's revolutionary thought with the bourgeois entrepreneur as revolutionary." He called it. Bourgeois radicalism. What, what Louis Hart says, and if there is one person that summarizes all of this, it is the English philosopher John Locke. <laughs> that's the word that's the they got stuck in. <laughs> Americans basically. We don't read law. We don't study law. Yeah. But I mean, you know, if, if, if you tell somebody, I worked for it, it's mine. That resonates with virtually every American. But we have a John Locke Society in Raleigh, don't we? And we have a John Locke Society in Raleigh, and what do they believe in? That. Limited government, private property rights. See, I mean, they call themselves conservatives, but in fact, they're classical liberals. One of my favorite lines in, in, in this, remember, this is 1955, Hart's writes, Locke dominates American political thought as no thinker anywhere denominates the political thought of a nation. He is a massive national cliche. This is, this is 1955. The Russians are doing everything they can to inculcate Marxist ideology into their populace. The Chinese are tr trying as hard as they possibly can to make themselves a nation of Mao's. What, Lo what Hartz is saying is we're doing a better job of indoctrinating Americans than any of them are doing. Because we don't have to teach it. We don't have to teach it because we live it. Understand it? Well, I mean, Throughout the 50s and 60s, I tell you, I was, this is how I was educated. I was educated that America is a liberal society and liberalism means lock. Okay? During the 60s, during the 60s, a different version, an argument was started against this. 
And it was says, yes, America is liberal, liberals. But there's a different branch of liberalism. And it begins by attacking this fundamental notion that humans are rational. It says, first of all, many humans are not rational. And secondly, rational people can disagree about what their rights are. We can't agree on what language we should all speak. By the way, well, we we can't agree on when life begins, on what a marriage is. Rational people disagree, and not only that. Not only that, the second thought argues humans basically aren't controlled by their reason. What they're really controlled by is their passions. Reason is, and ought only to be, the slave of the passions. What we call reason, in our smug little way, is just clever ways to get what our passions want. We are passionate, emotional people. We want things, yes, we're acquisitive. But our passions differ. And so our accurate, so what we want is different. And some pers some people's passions will get attached to some object. I really am hungry. That's my passion. But then my passion becomes attached to something. I'm hungry and I want a pizza. When your passion gets attached to some object or person or idea, we call that an interest. And this is what people pursue. Not their rights, but their interests. And they're quite willing to step on other people's rights in order to fulfill their interests. <clears throat> they use reason. Reason to them just becomes clever cost-benefit analysis is what I'm about to do, you know, worth it. Okay? Uh, this leads inevitably into conflict. Oh, because people are all, because people are in, individuals, follow this, they have different passions, they have different in, in, interests, right? There is, in fact, a diversity of human interests. Okay? The equality comes in by the fact that one person's private interest is no better or worse than another person. You're, I tell my students, you're a self-interested piece of human shit. So are you. So am I. Guess what? We're all equal. For this branch of liberalism, equality mean, comes stems from the relative, from the relativism of human interests. If you want to protect the environment, I've been told this. If you want to protect the environment, go do it. If I want to throw garbage in the river. That's what I want to do. Right? You don't want me to throw it in? Make it worth my while. Okay? That relativism of interests leads to conflict. And it's that conflict that produces what they call factions. What we would today call private interests. And those private interest groups will clash and fight and tear the society apart. And here's the important thing. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Because these passions and interests are in us from our birth. They're who we are. The only way you can stop it is to make everybody the same, right? Or to take away the freedom to express their interests. But as long as you do that, you're going to have conflict. So eliminating conflict is out of the question. What you must do is manage it. Okay? Stop it from tearing the society apart. Get people to cool their passions down. How do you do that? 
make, say, yes, yes, you can have what you want, but you got to go through the process. You got to you got to fill out these forms. You got to wait and <laughs> you know you got to wait for the next election and drag it out, drag it, out. hold out the promise. That's what keeps them committed to the system that they're going to get their interest, but then drag it out so much that eventually their passions cool. George Washington, I was one example. George Washington would say, said, human passions are like tea that's too hot to drink. But if you pour it into a saucer, it can cool, and then you can drink it without hurting it. I don't know about Washington's table manners. <laughs> but that's, that is, so you have two versions. I mean, these people, this, this is rights-based liberalism. See it? This is interest group liberalism as a just pure blind luck, I stumbled into this and I wrote my dissertation on the, the intellectual foundations of interest group liberals. These people did not like to talk about rights. They didn't believe humans had rights. Right? I mean, what is it? Have you ever seen one? Why look, what's walking down the street? It's a human right. <laughs> they said one thing we do know, you know, if you ask someone, do you have a right to this? You can, the, debate, the debate can go on endlessly. Do you have an interest in this? That we can answer. Just count hands. Whoever is interested in this, raise their hand. See it? And then we can have the, Humans do not share any values. The only two values that they need to share, the only two, they don't need to agree on rights. They don't need to agree on anything. All they need to agree is on toleration and compromise. You don't have to be like me for us to get along. That's important. Toleration is not the same thing as acceptance. Adolf Hitler tolerated everything he accepted. Do you tolerate the things you don't accept? Do you tolerate values that conflict with you? You've got to tolerate. You don't have to be like me for us to work together. And the other one is compromise. You can't expect to get everything you want. You've got to settle for less. And you've got to give something in order to get something back. These are the only two values that Americans need to share. Now, once again, I'll put out for your consideration the degree to which toleration and compromise as values are being undermined by both the left and the right in this country. Um, So this, the function of government, according to these people, all right, is to protect our rights. The function of government, according to these people, is to manage our, is to manage conflict. Does that make sense? Okay. If Locke is the major name here, probably in Britain, the major name here is David Hume. These people were these. Hume's Locke wrote 1688. Hume is writing in the 1750s. The stuff is coming over. It takes about three weeks for it to come off the presses in London and hit the streets of Philadelphia. Okay. Hume has friends in America. One of them, a publishing friend of his named Benjamin Franklin. His ideas are being cross-fertilized. So, now it's the 1960s, and it's like, yes, there's a massive consensus on values, and the consensus are based around liberalism, and that liberalism has two strands, rights-based liberalism and interest group liberalism. Then something interesting happened. A group of writers went back and looked at the language of the founding period and said, how much are these people talking about individual rights? Conflict of interest. And the answer is they were talking about it a lot. But there was another 
discourse, there was another language that, we, that came out. And they argued, this other language said, look, humans are not born individuals. We are a member of a species that we call gregarious. Every society in the history of the world is considered solitary confinement a form of punishment. We need each other. We want each other. We, th we can't thrive without each other. So the basis of human society is not the individual. The basis of human society must be community. And what is a community? A community is a group of no, 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 it's not. This is important. It's, it's people who share deep things, right? and they share private interests, but they also believe they share a common good, which is different than their individual goods. They share a public interest, which is different than their, than their individual interest. It's even not the sum of all their interests. Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, La volonté générale, ce n'est pas la volonté de tous. The general will is not the will of all. Everyone in this, everyone in this country might think economic growth is a good thing. But that doesn't mean that is the public interest. That is the common good. Now, these people, this, if this is liberalism, this got the name of, they went back and this became known as republicanism. Just as liberalism has changed, its title so it changes meaning, so is Republicans. But these people went back to the Greeks, to the Romans, to the medieval Italians a lot. Right? And they said, they said the purpose of society is to give is to give expression to those communal common interests. Now they weren't fools. They understood that people had private interests, too. But sometimes, and sometimes, sometimes the private interest and the public interest didn't conflict, and then there's no problem, okay? But sometimes the private interest and the public interest do conflict. And when the private interests conflict with the public interest, if you choose the, pri the public interest over your private interest, you sacrifice your private interest for the common good. You understand that? They call that virtue. And in political terms, when it expresses itself in political terms, they call it civic virtue. Volunteering, sacrificing, giving your time, working for others, working for your community members. See it? Now, again, they weren't fools. Sometimes your private interest and your public interest conflict, and you choose your private interest over the public interest. Yes? Mm -hmm. When that happens, they have a word for that. They called it corruption. That's a little harsh. Corruption? People were... People were Corrupt if they chose, if they pursued their private interests and, and over the public interest. Well, well, let me say this. Yeah, this was not sweetness and light. These were, yeah, right? And in fact, these, these people talked about rights. These people talked about duties and responsibilities. Okay? They talked about, and they, they greatly, greatly feared the spread of corruption. They believed that. They believed that we had to have a revolution, some of them. The Republicans said we had to have a revolution and throw out the British. Why? Because British society had become corrupt and they were spreading that corruption to America. See it? And we needed a revolution and it had to be bloody as hell. To purge us of the corruption. Oh God, they can't. Yeah. You think this is bad. Read some of Abraham Lincoln's speeches. Okay? It has to be, we have to revive the civic culture. We have to revive the civic virtue. And we have to do that by getting people to sacrifice for the common good. And so they spent a huge amount of time. The problem with corruption is it was sneaky. It snuck in in little ways. 
And so they spent all sorts of time talking about, talking about the signs of corruption. One of the signs of corruption was, interestingly, luxury. Why? Well, people get luxury because they pursue their... How do you get luxury? You try to get it. You work for it. You pursue your self-interest. Innovation became... Innovation became not a good term. Most importantly, the rise of factions was seen as a sign of corruption. See this? The Republicans saw factions as a sign of corruption. The liberals saw factions as just human nature. And so, whereas humans believe, whereas liberals believed in progress, Republicans believe in a slide, I call it entropy, a slide, the, the almost inevitable slide. Time brings change. Change does more harm than good. Change leads to corruption. There was this, there was this virtuous moment here when the Republic was founded. And after that, people just forgot their sacrifice, forgot the struggles that they went through, and just started to focus on their individual private lives. Now, so what you needed to do is you needed to trace the corruption, this produced, and then you needed to find some way to keep getting back to that original virtue. How do you do that? Education. Tell, teach the kids about the republic. Civic education. Boy, I'll tell you, when I, in my last few years in college, if you wanted to get a grant from somebody, just said, I am doing work on civic education. Okay? Get them to deify the founding fathers. Get them to constantly go back and say, is, does, is what we're doing, does it jive with the initial intention of the Founding Fathers. See it? Keep, keep going back. Getting them to volunteer. Okay? Getting them to every opportunity they can get to sacrifice, to set aside their self-interest for the common good. Here's the problem though. It keeps... This produces, this produces a kind of what's been called the politics of nostalgia. <laughs> a, 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 a nostalgia for the good old days. You don't hear liberals talking much about the good old days. Okay? But for Republicans, things are, getting, things are going to hell in a handbasket. All right? And the problem is, the, the question is, you know, how can we fix it? In 1976, a, a hugely important book by an Australian philosopher, writer named J.G.A. Pocock, writes a book called The Machiavellian Moment. The Machiavellian Moment. Subtitle. I mean, he's tracing this through Greece, Rome, who the American founding fathers, I mean, they were, I don't know how well they were steeped in it, but they kept quoting Tacitus and Levy and all those people, Aristotle. The Machiavellian moment is the moment when the slide into corruption becomes irreversible. And then it's just a downhill slide to despotism material. It's interesting that you think of Machiavelli. Machiavelli's great work was the discourses on the lives of the great Romans, where Machiavelli, Machiavelli argued strongly for the Republican point of view. But then he became convinced that the slide into corruption was inevitable. Humans, his, humans had become self-interested pigs. And if that's what they're going to be, then treat them like they are. Then he writes, sits down and writes to Prince. The only thing they can understand is pain and pleasure. <coughs> Deal it out. See? Uh, <coughs> the, the key 
key word here is individualism. The key word for the Republican tradition is citizenship. 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 Citizens. Right? Who is a citizen? I mean, according to these people, all you have to do is pay taxes and vote. Right? According to these people, no. Citizenship it requires I me. Mean, I, I ask my students, can you be a good citizen and spend your life never running for public office, never volunteering in any organizations, never being a volunteer fireman, never going joining the PTA? Can you be a good citizen and live your life exclusively according to your own self-interest? Boy, somebody ever said, you're damn right I can. See this? For Republicans, and here's that I hit them with, do you think it's possible, I show them more and put it, to have democracy without citizens? Do you think it's possible to have a democracy where nobody cares about that democracy? All they care about is Am my rights being protected? What's in it for me? Well, that was an hour. This is what Americans believe. The problem is this. A lot of me, these are logically contradictory as hell. All right? But next month, guess what happens in America? They all get jumbled together. Show me a pure Republican in America. It's tough. Duh. <laughs> but the problem is this. They're logically contradictory. So what do we do? We jump them all together. And in America, we, we call that pragmatism. Then the problem comes, okay, but what happens when something goes wrong? What happens when you have a national crisis? Who do you blame? The Tea Party might say, those damn environmentalists are, are interfering on my rights. Go over to go over to McDowell County, something I don't recommend. I mean you can see <laughs> you can see the bumper stickers. Stop streamside buffers. Protect private property. Okay? Now where does Ayn Rand fit in all that? Oh god, she is she Way is over there. She is Ayn Rand is pure. Uh, if there's such a thing as pure individualism, or pure liberalism, see, I mean, liberalism in America, right? Liberalism in America means, conservatism in America means liberalism. In Europe, I mean, who creates the welfare state in Europe? Bismarck! Hardly a bleeding heart liberal. But Bismarck's argument is quite simple. These are Germans. They're starving. They're homeless. Why? Because they're stupid and inferior people. <laughs> but they're still Germans. They are members of our community. They are members of our folk. And we must provide them with food. We must provide them with housing. We must create, I mean, he creates a welfare state on conservative principles. But conservative principles based upon national community. In America, if you ask why someone poor, liberals, conservative liberals will say they're poor because they've been monocolored and haven't been pushed hard enough. If you ask progressive liberals, they'll say they're poor because they haven't been given the right enough opportunity. But what both sides agree on is there's something you can do about solving their problem. These people don't necessarily believe in human equality. There are some people that are just lower down. That doesn't mean that they're not members of our community. See? Can you begin to see the can, can you begin to see the political and environmental implications of this? Huge. Huge. America is a liberal society. Louis Hartz, when he said all Americans are lucky liberals, was about 80% right. Mm -hmm. All right? He forgot that there's another version of liberalism, interest group liberalism, and he had no concept of this. 
But when you listen, when you listen to both the left and the right in this country, they're starting, they talk this language. I, I, I describe it like this. There was a big circle in America in 1776, and it was basically built around a Republican consensus about citizenship and everything like that. Then a wedge drove through. The American Revolution was seen as this great moment of creating this republic. I mean, those over the mountain victory boys, you know, and that. What did it take? I lived 30 miles from Valley Forge. Why in the hell did those guys stay there through that winter? I mean, home and their wives and kids and food and everything is 35 miles. They could get there in a day and a half. Why did they stay? I think it was a sense of duty, a sense of having a call, a sense of believing in something. Many people in the North were very, very worried, very worried that the revolution was taking place exclusively in the North. And that those Southerners down there didn't have a chance to bleed and die for the cause. When Cornwallis invaded Charleston, I bet it was the happiest day in John Adams' life. <laughs> oh, thank God. Now, I mean, I thought all of our, I thought all of our monuments were going to be at Bunker Hill and Valley Fort. No, 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 no. We're going to have the cow pens. We're going to have Guilford Court. We're going to be able to show Southerners, you fought and died too. You are Americans. That's it. And Francis Marion was proved to be quite a, a Republican. Oh, well, a lot, you know, the Southern, the you know, the basis of community, thank you, the basis of community had one of two choices, had one of two sources. There was agrarian republicanism, which, which was basically built around yeoman farmers, okay, the property class. And then in the North, you had puritanical republicanism. Any of you from the North? I will give you an architectural. I will give you an architectural lesson of every of every New England town. There's the, there's the square called the Commons. The Commons, and there's the Unitarian Church, and there's the Presbyterian Church. This is this is our version of diversity. <laughs> the Episcopal Church and the Congregational. <laughs> and the Congregational down here. That notion of Commons and the notion of a common good. Took either a puritanical form in the Northeast or an agrarian form in the South. Okay? Do you have any comments, questions? Was any um, uh, impact of uh, um, social doctrine of the Catholic Church impact some of this? <coughs> yes, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish this. Liberalism. <laughs> Liberalism became the driving force in America. There's hearts as well. But republicanism didn't go away. Instead, it was driven to the extremes. On the right, it becomes fundamentalist Christianity. Yes? Um, on the left, it becomes... This notion of a diverse community where we all recognize and share certain rights. But if you listen to environmentalists talk, well, I mean, you if listen to environmentalists talk, you will hear the word community, common good, used over and over and over again. And if you ask them, what's the problem that we face? They'll say, everybody's just out to make a buck. Okay? A lot of this, a lot of it, a lot of this, Pocock traces this back. A lot of this comes from the social teaching of Catholics such as Augustine and Aquinas. Okay. And I mean, where did the you know a lot of it traces back to the English Republicans during the Commonwealth period, people like Harrington. But where where were they getting their stuff? They were getting their stuff from the Italians, the Renaissance. 
when they read those people, one of the fascinating things is to go into Thomas Jefferson's uh, library and look at his, I mean, look, at, look, what was he reading? You know, he was reading Locke, he had Locke, but boy, he had tons of Romans and Greeks. Okay. Was that fun? Yeah. Did that give you some sort of context of what Americans believe in? You're right. We try to we try to blend. I mean, first of all, you have to see how these are logically, internally consistent, quite different, and that's that's the logic. Next month, the history of it is it all gets started. May I photograph that? No. <laughs> I didn't have enough paper to write on, so I'll make it easy on myself. How do you make a little cover? There, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Frank, can you talk a little bit about how all this fits into taxes? Because obviously taxes are for, for, for the common good and, and the health Well, no, no, no. No? Taxes are an oppression on me. Taxes are... Oh, ta yes. I mean, liberals believe in limited government. Right. The, pur the purpose of government is to is to uh, manage conflict and protect our rights. Libertarianism, right? Well, well, and, well and liberals. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, sure. Can you see now what people that we call conservatives in this country are actually liberals? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a conservative buddy of mine. He goes on and on and on about all this, and I said, "Oh, Bob, you're such a liberal." <laughs> <laughs> Which burns him up. Right. I love doing that. <laughs> Limited government. Limited government. See this? As opposed to... As opposed to these good. people. The, yeah. the function of government is to make you a better person. It, it's to educate you, give you opportunities for sacrifice and citizenship. Right? And of course, to fight off, it's to fight off corruption. When did the title switch? <laughs> <laughs> curious. Yeah. And, I, and the answer is Federalist Number 10 by James Madison. He says, by a republic, I mean a system of government with where representation takes place. And I've always thought, and thought so he says, by a republic, I mean. Well, guess what, Jim? That's not what everybody else means. <laughs> Everybody else, if you ask Thomas Jefferson here, the segue to the next one, if you ask Thomas Jefferson, what is a republic, right? He will say a republic is a system where you have virtuous citizens, paraphrase, where virtuous citizens cooperating and coming together and running the country for the common good. Who was it walked out of that? I've been to Pippin's Hall and said, we have created a republic. If you can keep it. But, uh, I think that's right. But by a republic, if you ask most people now, what does republicanism, I mean, what is a republic? They'll say it's a system of representative government. Yes? That's Madison's doing. <laughs> See? Can you be a good citizen and do nothing but pay taxes and vote? Madison would say, hell yeah. You don't even have to do, you don't even have to vote. I don't care if you vote. As long as you don't revolt. If you had to put a percent, 60, 40, 75, 25, what, how would you do it on these two? In our finer moments, this is the, this is the optimism. This is the optimism. Now, I mean, you realize this is a pretty pessimistic view. And, I, and let me come out of the closet, and I'm very sympathetic. <coughs> this, is, this, is, this is our... This is how we talk. Americans, this is our source of hope. Americans want to love their country. They want to sacrifice. They want to, they believe in a common. This is how we talk. This is how we act. I was going to say, you can, we can talk that good stuff, but don't, but don't. I had a student, I had a, I had a student, I, I had a student of mine, I had a student of mine came in after, a, after, a, no, it, oh, I don't remember what it was. It was, we had just invaded Kuwait, Iraq, and George Bush 41 had given his speech. And the student came and says, D, 
damn you, Dr. Kalinowski. I said, what's the matter? He says, I watched the president's speech last night and I couldn't enjoy it. I'm sitting there going, he's, he's talking, he's talking. I'm going, lock, 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 Hume, Hume, Jefferson, Jefferson, Jefferson. I said, look, what good does this course do? Now you know how to be a speechwriter for the president. <laughs> Throw in lots of this. Saddam Hussein's invasion of uh, Iraq violated the rights of the uh, uh, Kuwaiti people. It is against the common good of all the community of nations. Oh, and by the way, there's a whale there. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> a good speechwriter. Wouldn't mention the word a whale. <laughs> well, a good speechwriter. Heavy, heavy on this. But you better mention rights a bunch. Right? And if you want to drive the nail home, you just say, oh, by the way, there's something in it. <laughs> Would uh, American expansionism in the 19th century be a reflection of republicanism? <sighs> yes. Yes. Yes, because Republicans, the, yes, and that's a very good insight. The Greeks looked at the, the Romans looked at the Greeks and said, if they had such a great republic, why didn't it last? And the answer is, it got too contained. So what the, so what the Romans added to Greek thought was republican thought plus empire. Okay? What American thought is, for us to remain pure, for us to remain <coughs> virtuous, first of all, we had to remain farmers. Right. And secondly, and secondly, they had to, that meant that there had to be enough room for these expanding little communities of virtuous citizens. Right. <coughs> Sir Jefferson hates it like hell, but because he thinks it's unconstitutional. But he goes out and gets to Louisiana, and says. <coughs> I've solved our problems for thousands and thousands of generations. <laughs> Madison sits down. Lewis and Clark come back. It's 1810, 1812. <clears throat> they say, how big is this country? Lewis and Clark say, it's really big. <laughs> 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 but there's a lot of it isn't inhabitable and stuff. And he says, parts where you know, along the Platte, Missouri, good. Madison sits down there and figures, OK. We can stay a republic as long as we have virtue. We can have virtue as long as we have agrarian societies and citizenships. And we can do that as long as we have an expanding territory. How long can republican democracy last in America? And he actually does this. He figures up the numbers, figures up the growth of population, figures up the size of the country, and comes to the answer, 1929. Oh, <laughs> he does this in like 1810. Oh, no, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson thinks it's going to last thousands and thousands of generations. Okay? He doesn't consider it popular. Hamilton is scared to death of this. Because as long as people are farmers, we're never going to be a great, powerful nation. We need industry. We need iron. We need coal. We need a financial business. And who in the hell is going to work in a who's going to work in a merchant in a manufacturing plant in New Jersey when they can have a farm in Oregon? How is it? Don't buy Louisiana. Keep these people here. Get them into the factories. Get them off the farm and in the factories. Why? Because we're going to be we're going to be the biggest, toughest nation on earth. That's his dream. Those goddamn British that beat us at Bunker Hill, they're going to come crawling to us. They're going to be our little 51st state. <laughs> I often, I often ask my students, okay, here's your exam question. You've invented a time machine, or if you're friends of Rocky and his friends, a Wayback Machine. Um, <laughs> and you go back, and you go back, and you go back, and you get Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, and bring them up. 
What do they think? What's Hamilton think? Where would you take him? What would you show? I'd show a shopping mall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, combustible huh? engine. Combustible engine. Oh, yeah, I show him an interstate highway system. I show him, you know, maybe a couple of tight missile silos. Hamilton would sit there and go, Yes, 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 you did it. Jefferson would cry his eyes out. How many, what percentage of Americans are still farmers? So few that it's no, listed, no longer listed as an official occupation by the labor statistics. Really? Yeah. Wow. Madison would say, had any revolutions? Nope. Well, there was one over slavery. You know, I knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, only 40% of the American public vote in any given election. Mm. Madison would say, well, what are they doing on election day? Are they in the streets protesting? Can they overthrow the government? No, they're home watching World Federation wrestling. <laughs> That's okay. I don't care. Okay? That's fine with me. You don't have to vote to be a citizen. You gotta pay your taxes. Okay. Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson. Two dreams and a nightmare. See you on May 31st. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.